Hi, uh, nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, yes, yeah, great to be back in Calgary. I've, I've definitely been dreaming of uh, doing this show for a while, actually, so it's nice to, to see it come together. Um, yeah, it's a funny thing as, a, as an artist to, to try to talk about really what the meaning of it all is, because at some level, uh, you know, I really can't tell you what it means. And um, as I was preparing to, to come here today, I was reminded of this one uh, quote I, I like by Bob Dylan, uh, where he's talking about sort of the meaning uh, for him of his songs. And uh, he says, John Doan, the poet priest who lived in the same time as Shakespeare, wrote these words, the cestos and the bedos of her breasts, not of two lovers, but two loves, the nests. And he continues, I don't know what it means either, <laughs> but it sounds good, and you want your songs to sound good. And um, I, I really like that, because at the end of the day, you are playing with things you don't understand, or at least I am. So I can't really tell you what any of this means, but I can tell you um, about some of the people that um, have influenced me and some of the, the writers that uh, have given me ideas and, and, um, and some of the ways I made the work, you know, and, and the way I kind of got here, I guess. Um, so in that way, it's, um, I suppose what I should do is explain myself a little bit because uh, as I was working on the sculptures, actually, so the sculptures here, um, there's three of them in the show and uh, they're made out of wood. I made them outside. And uh, I've been working on sculptures since 2009 is when I made the first one. But they're always sort of a, a bit of a side project, like the paintings, the sculptures, and then the prints um, are sort of three different me uh, modes that I like to work in. Um, but I made these outside in the summertime. And it was um, in August uh, when uh, Salman Rushdie uh, was attacked, uh, and, and I'm sure we all read about it in the news, and it was a shocking event. Uh, but what it did is it uh, reminded me of, of how he had really influenced me in, in, in sort of an essential way. Uh, years ago when I was in India, uh, I motorcycled through India, like 10,000 kilometers all through, through the country. Um, and one night I was in a hotel, and I just turned on the TV, and, and there was a recording of Salman Rushdie doing the speech to the the India Times and uh, the, uh, this sort of conference, uh, and it was happening live. And um, so what I might do is just read a, a short excerpt. Um, so all of us know that in reality, we all have plural identities. Any one of us may be at any given moment, not only Hindu, but also a bald person, a father, a railway employee, a cricket fan, an asthmatic, a chess player, a movie lover, Identity is plural. We are all composite selves. The way we are with our children is not the way we are with our bosses. We are different again with our lovers and friends. When we define our identities accurately in this multiple way, we immediately find things in common with other people. Baldness, parenthood, work, sport, illness, hobbies, pastimes. <clears throat> What we have in common is greater than what separates us, yet we are in danger of forgetting this. And, um, you know, thinking of Salman Rushdie lying in hospital, uh, it seemed to me that I should, it's in some way, kind of pay respect to some of the, the, the ideas that are in, encapsulated in, in what he just said. And I think he says it better than I can, but in my paintings, I try to take some of those ideas and build different ways of thinking about, you know, who we are, I suppose. Um, so that kind of led me to want to do this one painting here of the, the conch player. Um, it's an image I, I had f sort of been keeping for a while, uh, and I didn't really know why I liked it so much, but um, I was somehow thinking that starting the show off with sort of the, the sounding of the conch, sounding of the horn, which sort of in many cultures has meant sort of a, a call to meeting or a call to a democratic debate or sort of a call to some kind of uh, uh, liberal democracy, you know? And so that's sort of why I began with that image. Um, and I gave myself sort of the freedom with this show that I could paint different people from different times in my life. Um, so over there, there's a portrait of my brother Leif, for instance, uh, who's an ecologist. 
And so the painting is sort of that, that balance between him as my brother and him as a, an, an ecologist and trying to weave those ideas into the painting. Um, and I guess that sort of attitude of trying to paint somebody in that way is really, like, I'm sure you can see, like, very in, uh, influenced by Van Gogh and, you know, his color and his brush strokes. And, I mean, I, I learned so much from Van Gogh um, at an early age. And I think one of my favorite uh, kind of quotes or uh, ideas about Van Gogh uh, was from uh, Kirk Varnado, the late, late great uh, Kirk Varnado, the curator. He was um, head of painting and sculpture at MoMA in the 90s. And he acquired for the collection this one painting uh, called The Postman by um, Vincent van Gogh. And it's a painting of a postman. And so these are Kirk's sort of um, readings of that painting. It's a painting of a, a postman, like a type, a sort of worker of the state. Um, but it's also a portrait of Joseph Roland, uh, van Gogh's friend and, and the individual. And I, according to him, anyway, and I think I agree, the best portraits, maybe, are, have to do with these, the tension between the two, of the type and the individual, and how we are both, in fact. And, but also with that Van Gogh painting, he goes on to say, but it also, in the colors, the vibrations he, he achieves in his uh, color arrangements, but also the wild brush strokes, that it sort of opens up into a, almost a frenzy of brush strokes, but that suggests perhaps the the particleization of reality and uh, that we are all stardust, you know? Um, yeah, so those ideas of the type and the sort of the three different ways of thinking about one person is something I've been working with for a long time in my paintings and sculptures. And, and so I see this show as sort of a continuation of that uh, portrait project. Um, so they're all people I've met. Most of them are close friends. Um, in a way, this painting kind of set the context for the show for me. Um, this picture is called uh, Der Grüne See, uh, which just translates as uh, the Green Lake. Um, so in Dusseldorf, where I've been living uh, during uh, COVID in 2020 and 2021, during the summers, we would take the train out of town to this place called the Grüne See. And it's about a 15 minute train ride with the subway and then you could get off and walk through a cornfield, and then you'd be at this, this gr the Green Lake, which was just this really tranquil, chill spot where we could all kind of hang out uh, as, a, as a group of, of painters and, and uh, draw and be in the fresh air and sort of escape the, the craziness um, of the last two years. So I see, like, in a way, uh, the lake and the idea that, you know, any of these characters could maybe be at that lake hanging out sort of was the ground for the show in a way. Um, this yellow painting here, um, it's called The Painter. It's of a friend of mine in Dusseldorf who's, who is a painter. Um, and he's standing, standing at the edge of the Gruner Sea, at the edge of the lake, um, which to me, you know, sort of means like you're just at the edge of something and, you know, it's at a threshold or a frontier. Um, but I'd always wanted to try to make a painting like this, a full-scale figure, like a, a bather, essentially. So I was thinking of Cezanne's bather, of course. Um, but then also Matisse's bather, that's a good one too. And he's like kind of stepping into the water at that, in the Matisse bather. Um, so I did that painting first, and then I thought that I, it would be, uh, the sculpture here would be sort of a, a painted version of that painting, or a sculpture version of that painting. But once I did that one, it, I, I was much more interested in, well, with the sculptures, I, I, I really enjoy these really simple forms and playing with them and using the intuition and just uh, circles and squares, rectangles, uh, triangles, and just simple forms and allowing my intuition to, to, to make the thing. But then later I can really paint into the sculpture and as an image going kind of through the, the very rigid structure of things. Um, so when it came time to paint this, I, I thought, like, just, he should just jump in the lake. So it became, a, yeah, a bather or a swimmer. And so hopefully people will kind of walk around the sculpture, and there's hopefully kind of a, a rhythm that leads you in and out of the, the harshness of the form, 
and then the, the feeling of swimming. Um, but around the time I was making the, the, the wood sort of structure of it, I, um, a friend came by and, and she told me she'd never learned to swim. And it, somehow that idea stayed with me because I'd already done this painting and I thought, yeah, like maybe the sculpture is really trying to share the feeling of swimming with somebody who's never gone swimming before. And you know, the cool, the cool feeling of diving into a, a, a lake on a hot summer day. It's, if you've never done that before, it's quite a strange thing to try to explain to somebody. Um, yeah, so yeah, continuing on, like this one's of uh, uh, Nina, who's a painter in Dusseldorf. And um, for some of these poses, um, when I got back from Germany, I somehow stumbled upon the photographs of August Sander, who's um, he's a really well-known, amazing uh, German photographer, but I somehow never uh, learned about him before. And uh, so I, I started researching him, and what he did is in the 1920s, he, in Germany, he set out um, trying to do a, a series of types of people, like farmers and business people, and sort of documenting types. And if that was sort of the point of his project, I think he really failed in, in grand style because what he ended up doing was creating this vast series of individuals. And none of them are types, but there's like 60,000 of them. And they're just, the, the compositions are really strong um, and all these incredible characters. So for a couple of the paintings, just sort of using that as a jumping off point, I, I used the structure, so the chair here um, is from a, an August uh, Sander uh, portrait. But I've placed my friend Nina there, and she's pointing downwards. You know, Goya used that kind of pointing movement before to great effect. And I liked that you're sort of, I think maybe the painting for me is about choosing or something. Like, you can go this way or this way. And the birds seem to be flying up to the upper right. Um, and hopefully you sort of see the, the, the parrots second, like as if you can kind of choose if you see the parrots as being uh, part of her sort of wild uh, clothing design, or if they're real parrots flying in front of the figure. Um, yeah, the Dusseldorf parrots are, oh, thanks. Cheers. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that uh, the personalities of your subjects are really important to you, and that's yeah. why you tend to paint friends yeah. and people that you know quite well. Yeah. So um, Nina seems like a good opportunity to sort of delve into that a little bit. Could you talk a bit about um, her? Like, what is it about her that's coming through in this painting? Um, well, I guess, again, like, it, uh, I, I hope you don't need to know this to, to appreciate the picture. Um, but again, like from my angle, the, the Dusseldorf parrots were these uh, strange characters that zip around, not just Dusseldorf, but many cities in Europe, but in particular Dusseldorf, these escaped uh, parakeet parrots. So they're like total foreigners in the city, uh, but they, they, they zip around and they're very agile and, and sort of flamboyant. and. So somehow I, I started thinking of the Dusseldorf parrots as being comparable to the, the young artists of Dusseldorf. Um, so the Dusseldorf parrots for me, yeah, represent that kind of wild freedom and uh, not really fitting in to the, the structure of the city. But yeah, so just you know, details like that, personal things about the particulars of the person and how I know them and how they look, but also what they do and all these things can hopefully find their way um, into the paintings. Um, so maybe now that I've kind of talked about this, uh, the bather, um, I thought if I was going to have a bather, I should also have a, a sun bather. Um, so this one is maybe just the f trying to express the feeling of, uh, of sitting in the sun and uh, something we can all relate to. And it's certainly sort of the, the unifying factor of our planet is that it's, it's uh, you know, powered by the sun. And it's sort of that one totally uni un unifying thing about, about all of us. So this one, this was the last one I did. It was just very playful and uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, 
and the sculptures were, yeah, it was, it was really a gas, like, moving through the different stages of the sculptures, um, from the way they were made into, into painting them, and then really sort of painting into them. Um, and in th this one in particular, it gave me a lot of freedom, so I hope you'll come around to see the back of that one. Um, So maybe I'll talk about this, this last uh, sculpture over here. Um, yeah, please. Um, your colors are so vibrant. It seems like they're a really important part of your work. Yeah. Can you use them? Like, is there, I mean, yeah. I know you said that it's hard to find these things sometimes. Yeah, no, but it's... Yeah, the, the colors, it, it goes back, I think, you know, this, this thing of, like, what does it mean to make a song sound good? You know, that's pretty vague, but, but also there's, there's certain things that I'm interested in in the paintings and, and creating this sort of um, visual energy very much um, inspired by Van Gogh from meeting his, uh, <clears throat> his diaries when I was quite young. Um, but last winter, I, I was actually in, in, in Spain for a while, playing, uh, like sort of an un plein air series, painting outside. And it gave me the opportunity just to re-research some of Van Gogh's uh, color uh, theories and compositions. And that became a, like I've been doing this for a long time, or trying to, but it, it was sort of reignited an interest in it very specifically for this series of looking at his uh, complementaries and, and triadic complementaries, but also the split complementaries um, that I really used for a lot of these, where you can have kind of like a, if blue and the orange are, are complementary, you can split the orange and bring it a little bit more an orange to red, and then also uh, more of a, a yellowy orange. And then those two can bounce with the blue to create what I think is a real visual energy. It's, a, it's an oscillation and, and there's that tension. Um, and there's things like that that I can't explain why I, I find that interesting, but somehow I guess it's just the visual experience and, and exploring that. Um, when I was in Dusseldorf, I got into mixing a lot of my own, yeah, from pigments and, uh, and you know, just, yeah, taking sometimes just dirt and uh, linseed oil and and mixing it up, you know, and uh, seeing what happens. And so that was a lot of fun, or it is. Um, but I think it relates somehow to this um, and my uh, interest in color too. It's um, like all my, all my life I've had uh, what's called classic migraine. Um, so quite often I'll get a migraine headache um, and just before I get a headache, I'll get this, um, visual disturbance, which is sometimes called a migraine aura. Um, but it's an extremely thi uh, difficult thing to visualize um, because you can't photograph this. It's, it's not even in the eye that this disturbance happens. It's in the brain, and it's in the occipital lobe, which you know, looks after uh, our perception, all visual perception, so of color and form and uh, um, and even movement. Um, so when I get one of these disturbances, it starts out uh, very small as a spiral here and continues to grow where my focal point is the center point of this growing uh, visual disturbance. And like I said, it's, it's a really difficult thing to try to, uh, to visualize. And I don't think I could have even drawn it really without uh, finding just in... Um, Last spring, I found these, these drawings by uh, Hubert Airy. Um, and he was sort of, con he's considered sort of a, a migraine pioneer uh, in that he really drew the migraine. Uh, he was the first person to draw the migraine form. And it's a very particular form. Um, and I posted the picture on Instagram and Facebook, whatever, and all these people co started commenting, like, oh my God, that's what I see. And, that's just what it looks like, and exactly that. And so all of a sudden, these dots were being connected um, of a whole range of people that I had no idea experienced this as well. So 
And it was extremely exciting for me. Um, so I thought I should try to make a painting um, of that, but I really couldn't have done it without Hubert Airy's uh, drawings. And uh, yeah, he's an interesting guy. His father was a, a George uh, Airy who invented or discovered what's called the, the Airy disk, which is, so he was a very famous astronomer in, of his time in, in the UK, uh, and he collaborated with her, uh, uh, John Herschel on this, uh, discovering the Airy disk. And what the Airy disk is, is that, that any lens, no matter, like even if it's the finest lens that you can possibly make, at some point you can never find a dot you will find what's called an airy disk, which is this rainbow uh, 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 disk sort of uh, shape. And by knowing that, it allowed them to make all kinds of other important discoveries, like you know, leading to Hubble and all these things. So it was a really interesting family. So then Airy started, a, the, the younger son, Hubert Airy, who did the drawing, uh, began a correspondence with Herschel. So it's all documented, and they're writing each other uh, like, so Herschel, like one of the greatest astronomers of all time, writing with Hubert Airy about migraines and how he got them too, and the older Airy got them too. So there's something about that that I found really interesting. And um, so I thought I'd try to make a painting that hopefully people that experience migraine can look at and, uh, and sort of uh, maybe relate to. Um, but yeah, it's a strange thing. It's, Wherever the focal point is, is of wherever you're looking, uh, becomes the center of it, and then it spirals out in these very geometric forms, and then the sort of moving uh, back and forth. It's a really strange experience because it's moving as well. It lasts about 20 minutes, and then it's gone. And then sometimes that's followed by an extremely painful migraine. Uh, so I did the painting first, and I was talking to my brother, um, I was sort of joking with him that it's too bad I didn't have a migraine while I was painting it. Like, I really needed my, my source material. Uh, and then, of course, like a few days later, I tried to paint the, the sculpture version, and then I did get a migraine then. And it was, it was quite a strange um, ex like life experience for me, in a way, just because looking at the actual painting like while I was having a migraine, I sort of was beginning to think maybe I'd exaggerated the, the intensity of it. But when I was really getting a migraine, it really wasn't the case at all because it's, it's sort of like the bigger strokes of the migraine are way off in your peripheral vision. So even if, even if I'm looking straight ahead at where that painting would be, visually it's like 30 feet away on the side of the wall or something. It's, anyway, it was very strange. And then I started making the sculpture while I had the migraine. So it was extremely unpleasant experience. And uh, I like the sculpture, but I, I hope I never have to make one again. So on the back side is more just the structure of the migraine. Um, so I called this self-portrait with migraine, and this is sort of the migraine. Um, but sometimes it'll be relatively mild, and sometimes I won't get a headache afterwards. But sometimes the visual uh, disturbance is extremely strong, and I actually go blind at, for a while. So, I wanted to build in that the sculpture from certain angles you can walk and at some point you can't see the eye and he's sort of blinded. Um, so maybe I'll just say a little bit more about this painting and then maybe if we have time for some more questions or, yeah. Um, so I like sort of putting these two together because, yeah, in some ways it is just like you keep kind of stepping forward and, and learning more about things that you don't quite understand. And so this is definitely a case of that. This one's called uh, Janus Point Theory, and it's based on this uh, new theory of time and space um, that's definitely influenced by really old ones too, but uh, it's based on a lot of Einstein's ideas, and uh, it's um, Julian Barbour is the physicist, and he was an, uh, an expert on Einstein who studied at the Cologne University, but he's, a, he's somehow related to the Oxford University too, I think. Um, but it's this idea that it's a little bit difficult to explain because I don't even understand it yet. So I'm really learning about it as I'm going. But it's a, it's a new theory of time and space in that uh, most theories of time and space are sort of asymmetrical in that there's a past moving towards the future and it's asymmetrical. Um, but his theory is that 
time and, time and space are obviously linked, but it's really just the shape of the universe that's always changing, and our perception of it as being time is, is something else. So in his theory, there's an equal and opposite uh, kind of explosion, in a way, uh, from the Janus point, which is really like, sort of like the Big Bang, in a way. And in one direction, it's going towards the future as we perceive it, and in some other way that is not understood yet, it's, it's equal and opposite in another way. So it's very much like an exploding butterfly galaxy or something like this with perception kind of in the middle of it. Um, and then it's, it's, named after, it's named Janus Point Theory after the, the Roman god uh, Janus who looks into the past in one way and into the future in the other. Um, so this is my attempt, first attempt at, at thinking about what that might look like. And uh, and trying to understand it. Um, so I think I'll kind of wrap up now, and we could have some questions. But uh, certainly, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Vivian so much for uh, you know her her faith and uh, just allowing me to to make the show the way the, the way it is. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. <laughs>